Welcome to church, everybody. My name is James. I'm excited that you are here. I'm excited for the rain this morning. I did not want to get out of bed because I love the sound of rain. It's just relaxing, comforting. How many of you did not want to get out of bed? You heard the rain too, right? It was awesome. But I did. I got out of bed and so did you. Thank you for being here. I love, love the Rain. Thanks, Tiago. Hey, we are in our Christ, uh, Case for Christ series. We're back into it after a two-week break. And if you remember, uh, on Easter Sunday, we kicked this off, and I talked about some barriers, uh, spiritual barriers to growing in Christ and learning about Christ that many people have, whether it's intellectual barriers. Maybe you have questions about Christianity, cr- questions about Christ and, and the Bible and what, what uh, historians might say. Uh, maybe you have moral questions, moral barriers to come into faith because Uh, You heard something about, oh, maybe I have to change my life to become a Christian, and so that's the true barrier. Uh, If if you were not here to hear that sermon, go on our website, catch up uh, the first two uh, sermons. Uh, The second week, we talked about the historical Jesus and the evidence for the fact that Jesus was a real person who lived during a real time a couple thousand years ago under the Roman Empire and the Roman occupation in the country of Egypt. Israel at the time, we looked at extra biblical outside Bible of the Bible evidence for uh, this person named Jesus, and I shared a few of that with you, some of that with you, and then we looked at the biblical evidence as well, and uh, I come to the conclusion that the evidence leans more towards the fact that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was a real person in history. And so today, we are looking at uh, the death of Jesus. What is the evidence for the death of Jesus. Now, I'm going to be talking about death this morning. That's not an easy topic to talk about. It is tough. I was just at a memorial service yesterday at our church. Uh, uh, a man who was about 54 years of age, he grew up in this church. His mom still attends this church. And a month ago, he suddenly passed away. And, and that, that is rocking his family, of course. And death rocks any family. And so what we're talking about this morning is not going to be easy. And, and uh, it, it, it's a painful thing emotionally to consider and to walk through. So I just want to give you that warning in advance before we jump into the evidence for the death of Jesus. Now, the Case for Christ movie came out in 2017, and and, and it shows a spiritual journey of a young atheist and an investigative reporter for uh, the Chicago Tribune, and he was investigating the evidence for Christ because he wanted to disprove Christianity, mainly to get his wife out of Christianity. And I don't know if you're a believer or not. If you're not a believer, you're so welcome to be here. And uh, we're thankful that you are here. And uh, if you are a believer, you might have some family members or some friends who want to convince you to get out of being a Christian, uh, just like Lee Strobel tried to do with his own wife in the movie Case for Christ. And I want to encourage you tonight at 6 p.m., come back again right here, 6 p.m., for the uh, showing of Case for Christ. Maybe you've seen it. I've seen it before. It's a powerful movie, a really, really great movie that will answer a lot of um, questions about the evidence for Christ. But come and have a shared experience with your church family. Invite your friends, uh, bring your oikos, bring your 8 to 15, those people who may be far from Christ, but maybe they'll have some answers, uh, questions answered tonight uh, during this movie. Now, the swoon theory, swoon, S-W-O-O-N, uh, is a theory refuting the death of Christ. Uh, it's talked about uh, today. There are modern books that are written about this theory, and it was first uh, uh, brought up about 200 years ago, and it's still a modern day uh, debate uh, today. And I want you to pay close attention to the dialogue in this clip from the movie that I uh, I wanna show right now. So check out the screen. So forgive me for making you travel all the way out here, but when someone rings me up and says he wants to dispute the most significant event in human history, I feel it's important that we do it face to face. Don't you? Yeah, that's fine. I I appreciate your time. Right, Uh, so we're, uh, just doing some research on the effect of stress on the hormone levels in mice, which is an ongoing project of ours. But I assure you, you shall have my undivided attention. <clears throat> okay, I'm, then I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, so my line of attack is this. The reason the eyewitnesses were able to see Jesus after Golgotha is because he never died on the cross. Right. 
Because if he doesn't die, there's no resurrection, right? That's right. So, so whether or not Jesus himself or, uh, or someone else took him off of the cross early, or if he fakes his own death, it doesn't matter. It completely discounts every aspect of the resurrection. Right, the swoon theory. Yeah, but he passed out, he didn't die. I'm afraid there's a long line of skeptics in front of you with that hypothesis. Including only a billion Muslims the world over who also don't believe that Jesus died on the cross because the Quran says so. so with all due respect to Islam, the Quran was written six centuries after Christ. I prefer my historical sources a bit closer to actual I understand, events. But, but, yeah. but you concede that it's possible. Mm. <laughs> Mr. Strobel, I am a medical doctor and a scientist. I have seen a great many strange phenomena in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But the swim theory is rubbish. <laughs> Rubbish, That's uh, is that a, a medical opinion? <laughs> you know, it is, actually. Um, Swan theorists tend to skim over the fact that Jesus was flogged prior to his crucifixion. Do you know what happens in a Roman flogging? Uh, um, yeah, the person is lashed with a whip. No, not lashed. Scourged and pummeled savagely. You see, the, the cowhide whip is braided with metal balls and bone fragments. The flesh on Jesus' back would have been shredded. The very muscles and sinews themselves laid open to exposure. The flogging itself would have left Jesus in critical condition for massive blood loss, which is why he collapsed under the weight of the cross that the Romans made him carry through town. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it possible that Jesus survives being spiked to the cross? Oh, yes, you could survive it, but it's child's play compared to what comes next in a crucifixion. Slow, agonizing death by asphyxiation. <sighs> Mr. Strobel, the crucifixion of Jesus is one of the best attested events in the ancient world. There is no historical evidence of anyone, anywhere, ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Oh. And, if you will, the final nail in the coffin of this woman theory is this. When the soldiers thrust their spear between Jesus' ribs, do you know what came out? Blood and water. Which we now know is a description of pericardial effusion as a result of death by asphyxiation. And this is not a condition anyone could fake. And so to answer your question, yes, it is my medical opinion that Jesus Christ died on that cross. Doctor? But, but, but... I, got a, I have a real problem with most of the experts that I've talked to here. Which is? Uh, which is that most of them are not impartial, and if I'm gonna take a guess, I would say that you are not either. And you would be correct, sir. Though I have learned that most impartial travelers who undertake this journey rarely remain so. However, I can refer you to one of the most impartial sources that I know. Would you trust the Journal of the American Medical Association? Of course, it is a stellar scientific journal, you and I will admit that. On the physical death of Jesus. <clears throat> Clearly the weight of the medical and historical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Doc, I gotta tell you, you're, uh, you're not telling me what I hope to hear today. All right, so grab your sermon outline notes. They are in your bulletin, and we have some fill-in-the-blanks that we will get to in just a half a minute. And uh, we're going to talk about the swoon theory arguments that they were uh, dialoguing about here. And so here's the two main arguments in the swoon theory. It's that Jesus' short stay on the cross, he, he wouldn't have died because he wasn't on the cross long enough. Many people who were crucified at this time in history uh, hung on there a lot longer than Jesus. So it was uncommon for a crucified healthy adult to die in the time that is described in the Gospels. See, the Gospel of Mark, in Mark 15, 25, it reports that Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m. If you want to jot that down, you can look at it later. Mark 15, 25. And then it says uh, later on in verse 33 of chapter 15 that he died 
at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, so about six hours after he was crucified, Jesus died, the text says in the Bible. Now, Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus had died so soon. It says that in verse 44 in chapter 15. Now, the average time of suffering for somebody who is crucified by Roman soldiers, uh, historians claim it, it takes two to four days to die. Uh, on a cross. And some people even lasted upwards of a week suffering uh, until they finally die on a Roman cross. So that's one argument is while Jesus was on the cross, you know, not long enough for him to actually have died before they took him down. And then B is there's a lack of eyewitness accounts of Jesus' dead body. There wasn't a big public memorial service for Jesus. Jewish custom was to bury their dead quick. They would bury their dead quick. So it's no surprise that a guy named Joseph of Arimathea would request the body for burial from Pontius Pilate which uh, the Bible text tells us. The transfer of Jesus' body allowed for the swooned Jesus. Again, that term means he, he passed out and he's just unconscious. He swooned. So uh, the transfer of Jesus' body allowed for the unconscious Jesus to be removed from the cross quickly and quickly hidden away from public eye with room to recover from his ordeal in an above ground chamber on private property. And so the coolness of this chamber eventually revived Jesus, who then showed himself to his followers as if he had come back from the dead. So I want to go through some counter arguments to the swoon theory, and this is where you can start filling in some blanks here. A, Jesus was tortured and scourged by the Roman soldiers prior to his resurrection. The, the pilot took Jesus and, and flogged him. In Mark 15, 15, it says, Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd. If you remember the story where he was, uh, uh, before he was led to be crucified, the crowd was uh, chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released for them another guy named Barabbas. And then having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, Jesus' state of health was already close to death as he was nailed on the cross. In fact, the average person probably would have died prior to the cross with what Romans put Christ through, through a scourging. Now, scourging began by stripping a person naked, tying that person to a post, and whipping or flogging across the back the buttocks and legs with the force of a professionally trained Roman soldier, or two, or three. It produced deep stripe-like lacerations from uh, the whipping with a ton of blood loss to boot. Now the whip that was used, I want to show you a picture on the screen, it's called a flagrum. It's called a flagrum. It consisted of braided leather thongs with metal balls and pieces of sharp bone woven into or intertwined with the braids on, on, on the whip. Now, the balls added weight to the whip, causing deep bruising and contusions to the body as the victim was struck. The pieces of bone served to cut into the flesh. So the bones would stick into the flesh. And then when they would rip uh, the flagrum back, chunks of flesh would be ripped away from the body. I told you this was going to be tough to go through this morning. Now, as the beating continued, the resulting cuts were so severe that the skeletal muscles, the underlying veins, sinews, and bowels of victims were literally exposed. It was that brutal. And it set the stage for what is called hyper, uh, hypovolemic shock, which is low blood volume in the body. And that would result in a few things physically in a person's body. The heart would start racing like crazy. The victim would collapse or faint due to low blood pressure. The kidneys would shut down to preserve body fluids. An extreme thirst would come upon the body as it seeks to replenish desperately the fluids that are being lost. Now, Jesus, he was too weakened. 
it was too weakened by what he went through to even carry the up to 100 pound crossbar part of the cross to Golgotha, the place where he would be crucified by the Romans. In, in Luke 23, 26, it says, as they led Jesus away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. Now, Cyrene is uh, in modern day Libya today. So he traveled all the way over to Jerusalem, uh, likely was a Jew who lived in Cyrene who came to celebrate the Passover event during this time. And he's walking into, into Jerusalem from the country, sees this um, crowd kind of gathering and soldiers barking out orders. And then all of a sudden they bark out an order at him. And he was coming in from the country, the text says, and they laid on him, they laid on Simon, uh, the cross that Jesus was carrying to carry it behind Jesus. Why? Likely because, I mean, think about this. Think about what Jesus' physical body went through and then throwing on a hundred pound piece of lumber on his back. The soldiers are not dumb. They know how to kill a person, and they know when a person is close to death. The Roman soldiers were commanded to crucify Jesus. That was their orders. And perhaps they knew that there was a big chance that Jesus would die under the weight of the cross beam of the cross. So these soldiers would have been fearful of punishment from their superiors if they didn't complete their mission of getting nails through Jesus' hands and his feet. So they compelled Simon of Cyrene. This guy was just coming in from the country, doing his thing that day, enjoying his day, enjoying the beautiful Jerusalem weather, and then boom, he is pulled by force to carry Jesus' cross. B, it's medically impossible to have survived the crucifixion. And you heard what he said from the uh, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. I want to read that again. I put that in your notes because this is powerful evidence for the fact that Jesus did die on the cross. It says this, clearly the weight of the historical medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead. He was dead before the wound to his side uh, was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear thrust between his right ribs uh, probably perforated not only the right uh, lung, but also the uh, pericardium and heart and thereby ensued death, ensured death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Look at this, John 19:34. John 19, 34, it says, but one of the soldiers, and this was after Jesus died on the cross, but one of the soldiers pierced the side of Jesus with a spear. And at once there came two things, it says, blood and water. Blood and water. The report in the Gospels could not have been fabricated as the text displays medical knowledge not even available at that time. The, the flowing of blood and water after the soldier pierced the side of Jesus was proof to an as yet undiscovered medical condition called respiratory acidosis. The major uh, physiologic effect of crucifixion was an interference with normal respiration, normal, normal breathing, and the normal breathing uh, function. Jesus would have had to raise up his body while he is on the cross to get a breath because the weight of your body uh, would cause you to slouch on the cross. And so anytime he wanted to breathe, he had to lift himself up, take a breath, and then go back down and rest as he exhales. And when he wants to breathe again, he would have to push himself up. Imagine the pain and the pressure on the nails that you're literally pushing your body on through your hands and through your feet. And again, Jesus went through that for six hours. Some people would go through that for days and days on end, pushing themselves up and down, maybe catching a 30-second cat nap in between breaths. I couldn't imagine that. And I read that, that uh, what Romans would do with, with women, if you were a woman, they would turn you around on a cross. 
because they wouldn't want to look in the face of a woman as she's dying on the cross. It, it, it's just absolutely brutal what would take place to a person as they are dying. So um, the, the, following, the, the flowing of blood and water from the, from the soldier, it, it affected the internal system, internal breathing uh, of Jesus at the time. And he was slowly suffocating as a result. And due to the loss of blood, the heart would beat faster to compensate, to compensate for the loss of fluids. Prior to death, the sustained rapid heartbeat caused by hypervolemic shock also causes fluid to gather in the sac around the heart and around the lungs. This gathering of fluid in the membrane around the heart is called peri uh, pericardial effusion. And the fluid gathering around the lungs is called pleural effusion. And this explains why after Jesus died and a Roman soldier thrust the spear through his side, piercing both lungs and the heart, why blood and water flowed from his side, just as recorded in John 19.34. Now C is Romans perfected crucifixion. They were professionals. They didn't invent it, but they perfected it. Roman soldiers were professional killers and crucified thousands upon thousands of people. They learned how to torture someone and cause the most pain that they knew they could cause before someone died. And that's the, why they started using crucifixion. Jesus' crucifixion was the most famous one in history, but it was not by far the only one in history. It was a common occurrence in the Roman Empire during this time. Crucifixion was likely actually invented by the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but the Romans... They perfected it. They took it to a whole new level. It was used over the span of 500 years in the Roman Empire. In fact, when Jesus was a young boy, there was a mass crucifixion that took place. Jesus was probably seven or maybe eight years old. And there was about 2,000 Jews in Israel who were crucified by the Romans. And crucifixion is, is ridiculously shameful, uh, the way they do it, uh, which is the point, and so painful that it spawned a new word to describe a new level of pain. Guess what that word is? Excruciating. It comes from the word crucifixion. Excruciating pain, it literally means out of the cross. Out of the cross. Now, in the Roman army, just like any modern army today, you have certain soldiers who are a part of certain groups because they become experts in what they do. And so there's an elite group of Roman soldiers who were assigned to the task of crucifixion. So they were trained in it. They knew how to do it. They were professional at their job. So when they would spend a day at the office, they got the job done right. And they would crucify people over and over and over. They were professionals. And this is, uh, there is no way these Roman soldiers would have disobeyed an order. If someone t gave them an order to crucify someone, if they didn't crucify and kill Jesus, their very lives would have been cut short for insubordination. There was extreme, extreme discipline in the Roman army if, if a soldier got out of alignment with the task and the mission at hand. And there's no way that they would have uh, risked their own lives by not following through on their order to crucify Jesus. Now, the evidence is too great for the physical death of Jesus. It's just too great. In my opinion, it takes more blind faith to not believe that Jesus died on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago. And why did he die? Why? Why did he go through this scourging? Why did he hang on a cross for six hours? Why was he mocked? Why was he embarrassed? Why was he shamed? The Apostle Paul, he sums it up beautifully in Romans 5.8. It says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, what? Christ died for us. It's because of God's great love for you and for me and for anybody on this planet who is far from him. He loves them so much. He loves you so much. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be part of your life. He wants to bless you and instruct you. He wants to give you the fullest possible life that you can live before there's a funeral service for you. 
And the way he offers that, because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner, is that we need a savior. We need somebody to rescue us from the effects of sin. And sin is, causes physical death. We know that we can't escape. We can't, <coughs> we can't escape that. But it also causes spiritual death, separation from your heavenly father. And he doesn't force it upon you, but he lets you know that you can be with God, your heavenly father, for eternity or not. And he says, if you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's willing to go to the cross for you. <clears throat> I deserve a Roman cross. You deserve a Roman cross. And it's incredible that God's great love would go to that length for me. And why would I say that statement? Because I know me. I know my thoughts. I know my selfishness. I know I can hurt other people and be mean, whether it's to my own wife or kids or, or other people around me. I can be selfish. I want what I want. Why would God send Jesus to die for me? And maybe you're asking the same question, and that's a good question to ask, because guess what? You don't deserve it, and I don't deserve it. The only thing we deserve is eternity separate from God in a place called hell, and I deserve it. And don't tell me I don't, because I earned it. I earned it, because the wages of sin is death. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why we gather here as a church, because we want to be on mission for sharing the hope that is only found in Christ with the 8 to 15 people God has placed in our lives. We use the Greek term oikos to describe that. You know, we all have a circle of uh, friends and acquaintances and uh, co-workers, and they're placed in your life if you're a believer, not by accident, but so that you can talk about Christ. You can celebrate your faith with them even with the people who are trying to convince you to get out of Christianity, kind of like Lee Strobel was trying to do with his own wife. And I'm so excited about the opportunity that God has given this church coming up this summer. We do VBS every year. This year, we are doing something way beyond VBS and, and, and the effect of VBS in a child's life. And we're even expanding the ages that we are going to be offering this for. We are going to be uh, partnering what is, with what is called Windshape Camps. I don't know if you've heard of Windshape. If any of you are from the South, the Georgia area, you might have heard of Windshape. They have physical camps in that area of the country, but they also have camps around the country. Uh, they have about 120 camps around the country that are hosted on different uh, church campuses and such. And they've engaged 34,000 uh, kindergarten through middle school age uh, children and students with what? Well, with the fact that God loves them so much that even though they're sinners, Christ died for them. That's the message of Windshape Camps, and we're partnering with them. So uh, Windshape Camps started uh, by a guy named uh, Truett Cathy. And I don't know if you've heard of that name before. Uh, how many of you have heard of Chick-fil-A? Okay, he is the founder of Chick-fil-A, and he was a believer in Christ, and he wanted to start camps and leverage the opportunity these camps would afford uh, for God's people to share the hope found in Christ with children and middle school students. And this year, we get to partner with Windshape Camps. And this means as well that we have at least, so far, two Chick-fil-A restaurants who will be advertising our camp this summer. Parents and, and, and students are going to go through drive through and they're going to get a flyer for our Windshape Camp at Chick-fil-A. Isn't that incredible? I mean, what an amazing, amazing opportunity God has given us. <clears throat> and so I want to encourage you, be part of what God is doing in this local expression of the body of Christ in this church to share the love of God and to talk about the gift of Christ, that he is our rescuer, that he went to the cross for our, us in our place because of God's great love. Do that in your personal life. Do that in uh, our church uh, programs that are coming up, including Windshape. And, and God is going to use you as a conduit of his grace to transform lives in Christ. There's no better thing to be used for. 
as I was preparing for this and reading about uh, specifically Simon of Cyrene, I read this article that John Piper, author and pastor John Piper wrote, and I want to share this with you. It's really powerful. Uh, he he uh, asked this question about Simon of Cyrene. He said, could the fact that Simon was chosen so suddenly and unexpectedly for the heavy task uh, be a Luke who wrote the gospel of Luke? Could it be Luke's way of teaching us that we don't always choose the moment of our cross bearing? We don't always choose the moment of our suffering. That comes upon us in unexpected ways, frightening ways, heavy ways, painful ways, seemingly random ways. In other words, the fact that Simon was chosen seemingly random, I mean, the text says that he was just coming in from the country, doing his thing that day, uh, going on a journey, heading into Jerusalem. He had his plans. He had his to-do list. He knew the people he was connecting with, who he was meeting with. And then all of a sudden, something random happened. He had to take up a cross, no doubt painful, no doubt threatening in his life if he disobeyed that order from the Roman soldiers. This could be a lesson that every moment of our lives, coming in from the country or coming in or going wherever you come and go to, we might be snatched into the service of Jesus in a painful way. You might be, I might be, and we just don't know when. Some of you are in the midst of a painful journey right now, and it's tough. Some of you will be taken up into a painful journey sometime in your life. What journey? I don't know. God knows. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Don't worship your pain. Worship Christ. Amen? Don't worship your pain, worship Christ. He has a mission for you to share the love of Christ with others. Christ had a mission at any time, he could have stopped the scourging. At any time, he could have stopped the shameful mocking. At any time, he could have gotten down off of that cross. But he had a mission, and he had somebody in mind. He had you in mind. He had me in mind. And he wanted to be our rescuer. And so no matter what pain you might find yourself in, no matter how random and crazy it is, don't worship your pain. Remember to worship Christ going through your pain and be a conduit of God's hope and grace to those around you. And even more powerful will be the fact that you do that in your pain. It's going to cause people to pay attention to the faith that you have in Christ. Now, last week, we shared a testimony on the screen uh, of Shirley Dunlap, how she was unexpectedly and randomly thrust into the service of Jesus in a painful painful way. Now, I want to encourage you, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, go to our YouTube channel and check out part one of Shirley's testimony, uh, because part two won't make as much sense uh, if you weren't here last week. So go to our, our Christ First Covina YouTube channel, check out part one, and uh, get the full context of the story uh, that Jesus had her go through. But I want you to watch right now part two of Shirley's journey through pain. Throughout Shirley's illness, there were lots of people praying for her recovery. Family and friends, people in my Bible study class, the anglers and builders classes, choir members, handbell ringers, and many others in our church. But through it all, God was our rock. He went through the agony with us. Praise His name. Just when things looked so grim, God stepped in and spared Shirley's life. So, one day, I just woke up. I was suddenly alert and aware of everything around me. But I had no clue as to what had happened. It has been a long road to reach the level of functioning that I have now, both physically and mentally. But I thank God each and every day for my recovery, for everyone's prayers and support, and that I have another day to live. He has sustained me through it all. And I'm so blessed that Bob and family have been beside me all the way. 
I'm also grateful for special people like Martine, a longtime friend, who faithfully visited and prayed over me every day while I was totally helpless. Most of all, I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit who is interceding for me to my Heavenly Father as I was totally unable to ask for anything myself. I know that Shirley is in God's hands. We both believe God still has work for her to do and we give Him all the glory. Although I do not have the strength and stamina I had previously, God has blessed me with the ability to continue serving Him through music by ringing bells, singing in the choir, and playing the piano and organ. What a joy that is! I'm also thankful that a scan revealed my cancer is gone. Praise God! In April of 2018, I received a new aortic heart valve and now I can breathe easily. I am amazed at what He has done and so very thankful that God has extended my life. This experience has definitely been a wake-up call that whatever it is that I need to do, I better not delay as I do not have the guarantee of a long life. I know that my life is in His hands and every day is now more precious than ever. And I want to make the most of every day He gives me. I'm open to His plan for my remaining days, months, or hopefully years. Serving Jesus is the most important thing in our lives. We cannot thank Him enough for allowing us to continue. In closing, I would like to share a verse from My Tribute by Andre Crouch, which expresses what is on my heart. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. For with His blood He has saved me. With His power He has raised me. To God be the glory for the things He has done. God doesn't heal everyone this side of heaven. But if we commit our lives to Him, He will do what is best for us according to His plan. And His plan is always the best. If you stay connected to God through Jesus, He will send His Spirit to reside in you. He will lead you through the challenges that come, give you inner peace when you are having hard times, and will take your request to God the Father when you are not able to do that for yourself. God is faithful. You can trust Him with your life. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get fixated on some things. And this morning, thinking about you know how somebody on the cross struggles with breathing, and she was talking about her new aortic heart valve and how it's helping her take a breath. I feel out of breath right now. Um, do me a favor, put your hand on your, your stomach so you can take a nice deep breath from your diaphragm. Ready, go, breathe in, hold it, and out. What a gift from God right there, amazing. And every breath that we get is a gift from God and we get the opportunity as she is doing with every gift that she has been blessed with until God calls her home. I mean, she's worshiping, she's, she's playing music, she's ringing bells and she's singing, she's being used by God. And my encouragement to you is ask God, God, how can you use me to serve you and to, and to bring the hope of Christ to many other people as well with the time that you have left? And if you... 
Do not consider yourself a Christ follower. It's as easy as A, B, C, A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus came as your rescuer. He died on the cross in your place and mine. And he defeated death. Three days later, rose again. We don't have to fear death now because Christ is defeated. He's, he's preparing a place for you and me in heaven. And C, choose to follow Christ. So A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in Jesus as your rescuer. And C, choose to follow Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your love that is so incredibly great for us. It, it, it doesn't make sense in my mind because, again, I know myself. Why would a perfect holy God want to come and rescue me? Um, but I thank you, God, for that gift of Christ, and we thank you. God, I pray for people who may not know you who are here or are watching this online through our website. God, bless them and draw them to yourself. I pray that their hearts and their their minds would be open to the work that you want to do in their life through Jesus, their rescuer. And Father, I thank you for Shirley, for her testimony, for uh, protecting her, for being her sustainer, even though she was on a ventilator and the doctors are calling family members in to say their goodbyes. You sustained her. God, when life seems out of control, you are in control. You are sovereign. You are all powerful. And whether it's our time to leave relatively early or we live a nice long life, God, that's up to you. But whatever amount of breathing we have left on this planet, we just want to honor you with it and serve you and be about your mission. And thank you for a church that is so mission-centric, God, with so many people and leaders and teams that we can be a part of to do something, to be involved in something that's literally going to outlast our own lives, God. We thank you for the gift of this church and the work that you're doing here. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.